I'm willing to argue that the cutest thing you're going to see all week is the tardigrade. Every day, NASA posts an astronomy picture of the day, and if you're not following it, you should be because every day you could be getting awesome pictures of stars and galaxies and planets and, last week, a tardigrade. Oh. So Popsi picked up this picture and before I knew it, I was lost in a sea of Google images of tardigrades and I decided that I just had to talk about them. Now I need to get over the cuddly adorable factor for just a second so that I can talk about these really awesome poly extremophiles. Also known as water bears, these little guys, most only a quarter to a half millimeter long, are plentiful and there are over 700 known species which can be found in both salt and fresh water. They like to live in moss or at the bottoms of lakes and they spend much of their time munching on bacteria and plant life. Now I love this description of them from a 2002 issue of Cell Biology. Under a microscope, a tardigrade looks a lot like a C. elegans in which someone has deviously expressed Drosophila leg genes. That is the most scientist-y way of saying that something looks like a chubby worm with legs. Now I mentioned before that tardigrades are polyextremophiles, and what I mean by this is that they can withstand many extreme conditions. Extreme heat, extreme cold, extreme pressures, freezing, radiation, and even dehydration. They've been found in boiling hot springs and under layers of Himalayan ice. They can withstand temperatures from negative 328 degrees Fahrenheit to 300 degrees Fahrenheit. And they can withstand pressures 6,000 times that of the Earth's atmosphere, and they can withstand about 1,000 times the amount of radiation that would kill a human. Tardigrades are such banffs that they can withstand space. And I don't mean in tiny little tardigrade astronaut suits. I mean they can be out there with nothing in the solar wind, sub-zero temperatures, and vacuum of space. In 2007, dehydrated tardigrades were exposed to outer space for 10 days. 10 days! And when they came back down to Earth and were rehydrated, not only did some of them survive, but they went on to reproduce. Bamfs. So how do tardigrades do it? Why are they so good at surviving and what can we learn from it? So it seems that most of their survivalist skills come from their ability to dehydrate. When stressed, they can curl up into tiny little balls known as tons, and they can drop their metabolic activity to about 0.01% of normal. Practically nothing. The tardigrades also produce a sugar known as trehalose, which helps to protect their cells, organelles, and membranes by suspending everything in a gel-like medium. Tardigrades have been shown to stay in that dehydrated state for up to 10 years. But when reintroduced to water in favorable conditions, they can rehydrate and be back to normal in just a couple of minutes. This dehydrated state is known as anhydrobiosis, and along with cryobiosis, the state in which the tardigrade can withstand freezing, it falls under the broad category of dormancy is known as cryptobiosis. Scientists hope to one day take the lessons that they learned from tardigrade stress response to develop techniques to help other organisms, including humans, deal with extreme conditions. Now about a month ago I tweeted this, and a couple of you replied that there are actually people making stuffed tardigrades. And I mean, if you know someone with a birthday coming up and you were thinking of what to get them, I think a stuffed tardigrade, perfect present. Now someone also responded with a link to this video of a tardigrade swimming in time to shut up and let me go by the Ting Tings. And guys, it's, if you're having a bad day, just go click on that video because it's awesome and almost as good as swimming sloth videos. Almost. Go forth, do science. All right, now this video is about to take a sharp right turn into historical storytelling, so hold on to your pipettes and your earbuds. Now, anhydrobiosis is not something that we have recently discovered. In fact, its first recorded observation was in 1702 by Anton von Leeuwenhoek. Now, if his name sounds familiar, that's because he's often referred to as the father of microbiology, and he made great strides in improving the microscope and was the first person to describe single-celled organisms. Now, he called these little guys animalcules, and at the age of 70, he wrote a letter to the Royal Society entitled on certain animalcules found in the sediments in gutters of the roofs of houses. Now I'm actually going to read you a little bit of what he wrote because I feel like paraphrasing Leeuwenhoek would be a crime. I have often placed the animalcules I have before described out of the water, not leaving the quantity of a grain of sand adjoining to them, in order to see whether, when all the water about them was evaporated and they were exposed to air, their bodies would burst, as I had often seen in other animalcules. But now I found that when almost all the water was evaporated, so that the creature could no longer be covered with water, nor move itself as usual, it then contracted itself into an oval figure, and in that state remained. Nor could I perceive that the moisture evaporated from its body, for it preserved its oval and round shape unhurt. 
in order to more fully satisfy myself in this respect, on the 3rd of September, about 7 in the morning, I took some of this dry sediment, which I had taken out of the leaden gutter and had stood almost two days in my study, and put a little of it into two separate glass tubes, wherein I poured some rainwater which had been boiled and afterwards cooled. As soon as I poured on the water, I stirred the whole about, that the sediment which, by means of the hairs in it seemed to adhere like a solid body, might the sooner be mixed with the water. And when it had settled to the bottom of the glass, I examined it and perceived some of the animalcules lying closely heaped together. In a short time afterwards, they began to extend their bodies and in half an hour, at least a hundred of them were swimming about the glass, though the whole of the sediment which I had put into it did not, in my judgment, exceed the weight of two grains. The preceding kinds of experiment I have many times repeated, with the same success, and in particular with some of this sediment which had been kept in my study about five months, and upon pouring on it rainwater which had been boiled and afterwards cooled, I saw in a few hours' time many of the animalcules before described. And if, after being so long in a dry state, these animalcules upon water being given to them can unfold their bodies and move about in the usual manner, we may conclude that in many places, where in summertime the waters stagnate and at length dry up, there may be many kinds of animalcules which, though not originally in those waters, may be carried thither by waterfowl in the water or mud adhering to their feet or feathers." Now that letter is over 300 years old, and that moment of observed discovery is still so cool to me today, and it's so cool that we can read that and read his original words and experience that excitement with him. Now it's most likely that the animals that Leuven Hook saw were rotifers, but it is also possible that his samples contained protozoa, nematodes, and tardigrades. 